Our next speaker, our plenary keynote speaker, is Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law and Columbia Law University um, Law School. And if you know, that's bi-coastal, West Coast and East Coast. She is a leading authority in the area of civil rights, black feminist legal theory, and race, racism, and the law. Her hometown is Canton, Ohio, and eight years ago she founded the African American Policy Forum to house a variety of projects designed to deliver research-based strategies to better advance social inclusion. I'll be brief so she can have the, the mic, but we'll add that our speaker introduced our country and globe as well as um, to, the, to our lexicon, the word intersectionality, which is, uh, provides a way to study and discuss and analyze the axis or intersection of gender, race, class, and a multitude of, of characterizations of people. And as a, a African-American woman from the South, of a middle-class family who's left-handed, um, definitely uh, appreciate the, the introduction of the word and her coining the word. And so at this time, I introduce you to Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. Good afternoon. So thank you for that kind introduction. and. Um, it's, it's really a privilege to be here. I want to thank Chad for uh, extending an invitation to tell me a little bit more about this network and to give me a wonderful opportunity to uh, visit uh, Birmingham. Um, this was my first time here, and to have the privilege of visiting the Civil Rights Museum last night and to do so with this community was really a special gift. Um, I was, I was moved um, by that experience. Um, I, I saw it as a stunning uh, immersion into the monumental movement of a dispossessed people uh, to insist on their freedom. And for it to be across the street from the 16th Street Church, which I consider to be just sacred ground, um, where the, the spirit of collectivity um, that determination, that courage and that, that an entire generation of people shared um, is, is palpable in, in that space. So it was in walking through that museum last night, seeing people of all statuses speaking truth in the face of terror, unwilling to back down, seeing children and teenagers placing their lives on the line, witnessing entire communities staring down specious declarations of states' rights, standing up against the prevailing opinion of the day, asserting, as Dr. King said, the moral, the constitutional, and the political imperative of equality. Witnessing all of this just redoubled my commitment to share with you what I consider to be some of the most critical obstacles that we currently face. The experience, in my mind, uh, placed in sharp relief the narrowed parameters of what I consider to be the contemporary conversation about race that I think has sharply cur curtailed our collective mobilization and has clipped the wings of our soaring aspirations to secure full equality. So a lot of this malaise is wrapped in, up in the idea that we are post-racial or to borrow the term from our recently departed uh, president, that in terms of race, we can say mission accomplished. Um, but when we see it all uh, the more in our conversations among ourselves, I have to say that it is at that moment that I became even more convinced um, that what we are dealing with is a problem that is right at our doorsteps. So we see it in our conversations, even intraracially, when it was once a space where we could talk openly and honestly about how we live in a society that is grounded in race, that is shaped by race, that continues to be enforced and informed by race. Now we talk about it in codes and ellipses, 
We're hesitant to give voice to what any number of statistics tell us, everyday experiences remind us, and our life chances continue to tell us. We can see it, I think, in how much we celebrate the victorious history that brought us this far and how little we know about the current strategies that have dismantled plank by plank the scaffolding that sustains our continued quest for equal justice. Our media don't tend to tell us anymore, and sometimes our organizations fail to inform us exactly about what is at stake. So for example, by a quick show of hands, I'm going to ask a couple questions that are obvious and then some that aren't. So how many of you have heard of Brown versus Board of Education? How many of you heard about Parents Involved versus Seattle? Okay. How many of you heard of Greta versus Bollinger? How many of you heard uh, Fisher versus Texas? Okay. So Brown and the later Grutter cases are the cases that affirmed a compelling interest of our society in breaking down the vestiges of segregation. Parents Involved, on the other hand, was a case in 2007 that virtually gutted Brown versus Board of Education, eliminated the ability of school districts to continue their efforts to eliminate racial isolation in our public schools. Moreover, only one vote prevented the court from declaring that a diverse and integrated society was no longer a compelling state interest that anyone could pursue. I just want you to think about that for a second. Fisher versus Texas is a case that's going to be argued next week. It may well extend this disappointing rationale to public universities, overturning after only 10 years Grutter versus Bollinger, which allowed universities to take race into account as a holistic measure uh, of uh, weighing the qualifications of students. Estimates are that the percentage of black and Latino students will fall nearly 60% in flagship schools. That already narrowed pipeline might be narrowed even further. If California is an example, the consequences could be worse. Let me tell you something about my own law school, UCLA Law School, where black enrollment fell before an anti-affirmative action measure took place from 40 to 50 students a year to two. 40 to 50 to 2. Now, our numbers have improved incrementally since to about 12 to 14 enrolled a year. But think about what that means over a 10-year period. We're talking the difference between 500 black lawyers over a 10-year period versus 140. And this is only applicable to one school. So multiply this by dozens of schools that are currently entrapped by anti-affirmative action measures, and you'll get a sense of the monumental consequence of this particular pushback. Now, this is not an obstacle that can be thought of as solely a class obstacle. In fact, as some schools, including my own, have attempted to adopt modest class-based affirmative action efforts, students from more elite backgrounds, students who have gone to the elite prep schools, those who have had all the benefits, actually fare less well in the admissions process. At UCLA, we now reject black students who go on to Stanford, Columbia, and Chicago. And while this particular case may only apply to public universities, we've learned from Grutter, a case we actually won, that private institutions often see what they say, the handwriting on the wall. So they withdraw their affirmative action programs before the law even reaches them. So there is, in a word, little fight in these institutions that once opened the door to us who were previously excluded. Now, what I want to address here is what all this has to do with philanthropy. And time permitting, I want to make a few suggestions about what it may mean. One of the key ideas from yesterday's uh, evening conversation was that within philanthropy, it's important to know and to be able to speak to the particular causes, the reason why, to use the metaphor that was brilliantly offered yesterday, some people don't have fish to eat. To know why we have to teach them. To know how to teach communities how to fish. What was key to our ability to move collectively many years ago 
was a clear assessment of what the barriers are and an ability to speak about them, to mobilize around them. Now, our ability now to do so has been compromised, and not naturally, but by a particular kind of philanthropy. Many of the legal challenges to the civil rights gains that we made were facilitated by an aggressive effort by those who have opposed civil rights from the beginning. These efforts have not been matched by those on the other side of the aisle. So today's discourse about racial justice might be framed um, around two competing ideas. Uh, one being that our society is one that continues to need repair. And another idea is that our society is a society where nothing is owed and nothing is due. Now, um, these two ideas can be represented by two of the leading thinkers uh, on either side of this debate. The first idea is an idea um, that was offered by Martin Luther King at the March on Washington. The notion that we're owed a promissory note uh, of equality that's come back stamped insufficient funds. The idea is that there's a society in the offing and a society that we can imagine but has not yet been created and our goal has to be to create that society. Speaking back to Martin Luther King um, has been Antonin Scalia who essentially makes the argument that nothing is owed and nothing is due. The society we have is the society we deserve. So the level of inequality that still exists in our society is just natural, is normative, and more importantly, any effort to intentionally change it is preferential treatment. Reverse discrimination cannot do it. Now, this idea, of course, repudiates the notion offered by King and by Marshall and by others who say, in order to get beyond race, you have to take race into account. On the other side of that, is the idea, the way to stop race discrimination is to stop thinking about, talking about, acknowledging, paying any attention to race whatsoever. And these ideas are represented by our current Supreme Court. Now, this idea has influenced a range of policies and struggles that we've had in any number of states, like California, Washington, Michigan. They've all been battleground states around whether one can take race into account in distributing contracts, in determining whether there's disparate impact, discrimination in employment, in determining the distribution of resources for public education, and in determining access to higher education. Now, these struggles have been funded handsomely by people on the other side of the philanthropic community, by organizations that have funded people like Charles Murray, who argued that blacks were intellectually deficient. You may have remembered that that was a hot book on the bestseller for many, many months a few years ago. And people like Dinesh D'Souza, who argued that Slavery was a civilizing influence for us for which we should apparently be grateful. Now, these efforts haven't been limited uh, to what we consider to be traditional affirmative action. They've extended to efforts to handcuff states from even collecting racial data so that equality, inequality that's apparent in neighborhood and community funding and health care and racial profiling and contracts and employment, all the data that would be essential to monitoring our progress would be taken off the table. With no racial data, there is no problem. Nothing but anecdotal information, but nothing to prove the level of the problem. Now, efforts have also been made to limit the scope of Title VII, and some conservatives have even set their sights against the constitutionality of Title VII itself. This is to be joined by efforts to rule the Voting Rights Act unconstitutional. Cases are in the Supreme Court right now that seek to do that. And our Supreme Court justice, the one that most African Americans have supported, has suggested many times in the past that perhaps the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional. Now, these attacks harken back to the days where right here in Birmingham, um, when people were asked to serve African Americans, they were saying, that violates my civil rights, violates my property rights, to have to abide by equal opportunity. I could go on, but there's one basic thing that I want to say to you, and that is that there's a sense of inevitability uh, 
um, around these issues um, that have been the hallmarks of the civil rights movement. And this sense of inevitability is not natural. It's been funded. And on top of the funding, it leads to a second problem. And that is, it literally has shaped the ground that we are working on. It pushes certain conversations off the table. We're told that most of our messages have to be shaped by those who don't want to hear about race, who don't want to know about the history, who believe that there's no such thing as race discrimination anymore. Polls tell us that many white Americans believe that discrimination is a thing of the past, with the exception that many believe that white males are more likely to be discriminated against than anyone else. And the court cases bear that out. So as a consequence, we're told to defend affirmative action, to defend the Voting Rights Act, to defend any number of these policies that have been critical to creating the advances that we have. We're not supposed to talk about race. We're not supposed to use the terms. We're not supposed to acknowledge that many of these programs have been central. Had this current approach to racial justice been in full swing in the 60s, we wouldn't have had the March on Washington. We wouldn't have had that magnificent speech. Can you imagine the Freedom Riders first take, taking a poll of white America to see, do you support desegregation of public accommodations? And if the answer is no, we're not going to do the Freedom Rides. The whole point of these activities was to push the ideas, to push against what people didn't want to do and didn't want to hear. And now we're basically told that what people don't want to hear, we shouldn't say. What kind of advocacy is that? So take, for example, this question about affirmative action. It appeared in the Newsweek battle during the last uh, uh, battle over affirmative action. And it says, uh, uh, 10 ways, is it 10 ways to think about affirmative action now? Now, looking at that picture, what are some of the ways that it's telling you you should think about affirmative action now? It's only about black people, not other people of color. What else is it telling you? It's, it's about young people. But what kind of young people? What, what does this guy's class background look like? Middle class, African Americans. It's not about women. It's not about other people of color. And it's not about economically marginal people. Now, you might think that this person had something to do with the last affirmative action case. Would it surprise you to know that he's a model? Those aren't his clothes. Those aren't his glasses, right? Somebody created this image to tell a story to help you think about affirmative action, potentially as unnecessary, unwarranted, preferential, something that we can do away with, right? That's the third rail. That's what we're fighting as well. It's not just the policies. It's not just the people on the other side of the aisle that are funding handsomely efforts to create these kind of images. It's the media itself that's reproducing this. Now, some people will say um, that what we need um, is to uh, simply tell the truth about affirmative action, tell the truth about how it doesn't just benefit the middle class, it actually created the middle class. So I want to tell you a story about one time that we attempted to do precisely that. This is my colleague, Luke Charles Harris. Uh, we founded the African American Policy Forum together. Um, and he's from Camden, New Jersey, the poorest city in America. Uh, and he was invited onto Nightline to be interviewed with Diane Sawyer, who was doing a special uh, on uh, an opportunity, what to do uh, about all the children uh, who were existing in poverty without uh, opportunity. And he was asked, how did you emerge from the poorest city in America to become chair of the political science department at Vassar College? What does your success tell us about what we have to do for the children of Camden? So Luke told a story woven around race and class-specific obstacles that he faced the role of what's now called entitlement programs to actually put food on the table so he could study, targeted scholarships that gave him the opportunity to go to better schools, affirmative action programs that allowed him to have access to Yale Law School, development faculty programs that gave him a job at Vassar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he 
and we were all incredibly excited. Finally, a story can be told that challenges all those myths about affirmative action, what it doesn't do, how it hasn't been effective, how it does more harm than good. So we gathered a little uh, party around the table. We were like, we can't wait till this comes on. We were so excited. And on comes the interview with Diane Sawyer. We see Luke and we see Diane. Luke starts to talk. And before you know it, he's now told a story through editing of what he calls a black Horatio Alger story. A man who pulled himself up from segregation and poverty by his own racialized bootstraps. No structural interventions were mentioned. No targeted opportunities were discussed. No need to rethink. Criteria was necessary. Only hard work and determination was all. Nightline had excised every single mention of race that Luke had mentioned. Not excised, of course, was everything he said about poverty, crime, drug dependency, and all the social pathologies that plagued his community and his family. So this is just a reflection of the one-sided nature of our discourse. The fact that we can talk about race when it comes to explaining our deficits as a people, as families, as men and women, but we can't talk about racism. We can't talk about the need for specific kinds of understandings of barriers and historical obstacles to change. Now, this is a problem of framing. I just want to give you this one um, example um, of framing. So um, if you were to look at this picture um, without the clouds, um, I would ask you, uh, what's the problem uh, with these cows? I would tell you that the cows are sick. And I would ask you, who's responsible for the cows? Now, if you don't see anything but um, the, um, the rest of the cows, um, you would say, well, the farmer's responsible, right? It's his fault if the cows are sick. But when we broaden the frame and we see all the pollution around the cows, right? We say, well, wait a minute. Maybe it's not just the cows or the farmer's fault that they're sick. Maybe it's environmental. Maybe it has to do with what all of that other stuff is. And more importantly, what it means to us is that we're also affected by that environment, right? It's all of our responsibility. Well, part of what we need is a narrative that allows us to tell the story about race in the same kind of way. We need to talk about the environmental dimensions of it, the fact that it's something we're all responsible for. Unfortunately, our conversation about affirmative action doesn't do that. So this is a typical way in which affirmative action is talked about and imagined. The, 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 the black woman is ahead. She wins, not because she's the best runner, but because she got a head start, right? And both liberal defenders as well as conservative critics agree with this, right? They, they say this is descriptively accurate. We've got to give you know, um, disabled runners a head start, right? They're damaged runners. If they're going to have a chance of winning, you got to give them a head start. But what we've come to believe is this is not an effective way of talking about affirmative action, right? The issue is not damaged runners. Um, the issue is actually uh, damaged lanes. The issue is the idea that some of us are running along tracks that historically and in contemporary ways have been damaged. And so our ability to run the race is compromised by what's on the track. So I want to show you just a quick um, uh, cartoon that we've created that we think actually effectively speaks to the better way to think about the need for equal opportunity policies and that pushes back against those who say you can't talk about these ways uh, in ways that persuade uh, uh, the public that we need to. So let us uh, try to see that video. And so I'm told the video doesn't come up yet, so maybe by the time we get to Q&A, it will come up. Um, so the basic idea um, is essentially that uh, equal opportunity uh, has to be thought about in terms of removing obstacles from the track, not just uh, giving people a head start. At the end of the day, um, to, towards my conclusion, we, we have to resist the idea that the best way to advance our interests is not to talk about them and to figure out ways of including anti-racism
and racial justice into other kind of agendas. Um, globalization is one agenda. Uh, pushing back against discrimination uh, on the basis of age is another one. There are all these different ways that we're being advised to talk about race. But let's think about this. If we were to say, um, want to protect against uh, brown lung disease, which is usually caused by asbestos, would it make any sense to think that what we really need to do is tell people um, that the strategy is not to think about asbestos, not talk about asbestos, to not use the word asbestos, to not develop toolkits to identify asbestos, right? Um, that we can protect ourselves against asbestos if we just agree never to think about it, never to talk about it, uh, to do the hear no evil, see no evil, think no evil. Now, we know that that kind of approach uh, wouldn't make any sense at all, right? We understand that even children will get that it makes no sense to try to solve a problem if you can't name the problem, right? So essentially, we're in the same position with respect to race. What we need to be able to do is collectivize our understanding in the same way we collectivize our resources, which is the theme of this space, in the same way we collectivized our, um, our efforts in the 60s. We need to be able to ground our understanding, our giving, our organizing, and our strategy towards a collective narrative. Now, I conclude by suggesting what's at stake here. So obviously what's at stake is our own lives, but what's also at stake is the future of our children, both here and across the globe. The black middle class, unlike other groups, hasn't been able to effectively pass on its middle class status, right? A lot of people, when I talk about these affirmative action cases, think well, I'm talking about someone else's kids. They don't know I'm talking about their kids, right? So our ability to ensure that our children have the same educational opportunity we had is not as secure as we think it is, right? So some of this, we're fighting just to make sure that leaky bucket that we have, right, that has a big hole in it called institutional inequality is able to pass on the resource to the next generation. But what is at stake is not just here. What's at stake is people of color around the globe. So one thing that you may not know is that in Brazil, just this year, an affirmative action program has been unanimously supported by the Brazilian Supreme Court. Brazil's 50% of African descent. There are less than 2% of the people who attend colleges and universities, right? Over the next four years, Brazilian universities are going to see upwards of 50 to 60,000 new students matriculate into colleges and universities. Right? But what's challenging them right now is people opposing them are looking to the United States. Right? They're saying even the United States, which has championed affirmative action for the last 25 years, are pulling back on it. And many people of color are saying, yeah, we can do without it. Right? So even if we weren't just fighting for ourselves, we have to remember that we're also fighting for people of color all over the globe, like in Colombia and in France and in other countries who are finally able to advocate for and to achieve some affirmative efforts to restructure opportunity in our society. Some century ago, W.E.B. Du Bois said the problem of the 20th century was the problem of the color line. I'd like to say that the problem of the 21st century is the problem of the colorblind. Colorblind solutions don't work to colorblind problems, however they may intersect with class, gender, and other factors. If we adopt, accept, settle for colorblindness, it will hobble our efforts to ensure and expand the legacy of those courageous men, women, and children who handed us this baton. Our objective, if nothing, is to take that hand off and finish that race for them. Nothing less will do. Thank you. So we've got about 10, 15 minutes of uh, 
I imagine those evocative remarks from Kimberly make some of the curious people in this room want to ask some questions. So I'd ask you to keep your, keep your questions short and tight so her answers, there's more time for her to respond. And be sure to identify yourself uh, before you speak. Uh, good afternoon, thanks, uh, Professor Crenshaw. Uh, my name is Paul Del Daniels, I'm with the Foundation for Louisiana. And um, in many ways, we feel like Louisiana is ground zero for rolling back the clock. Um, we see the institutional issues, um, the work of the governor and the legislature to actively roll back rights and protections um, and aggressively um, undermine the lives of your point, folks who live back on the other margins. I wonder um, what ideas you might have as to how we can uh, connect with law professors and other um, academic strategists to pull them closer into these conversations. I feel like there's a bit of a disconnect between strategy um, and the sort of intellectualism that we saw during the civil rights movement connecting with grassroots movements mm -hmm. and how we can connect the dots maybe connect into some of that intellectual power. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for that question. Um, so I stand on the other side of that divide wanting to ask the same question, right? How can we uh, build the kind of relationships that were essential uh, to pushing forward the first generation of, of policy and civil rights interventions? I mean, sometimes we tell the story as though um, our academics, our researchers, our people who looked at the history and were able to uh, more or less lay out a, an architecture for the kind of things we were demanding weren't part of the movement. And that absolutely undermines you know, what the collective dimension of the movement really was. It was people on the street, it was the people who were marching, it was the lawyers, and it was also the researchers and academics. I mean, you all know, had it not been for Kenneth Clark's doll studies that actually showed that the effects of segregation weren't just imaginary, but actually children as young as four and five understood what it meant to be black in this society, was a key point of Brown versus Board of Education, right? That was absolutely essential. What unfortunately I think has happened is that part of our professionalization and, and part of the differential direction of our different spheres have grown apart. And, and what does now seem to influence more how we go about establishing strategy is polling and focus groups, right? What will people go for? So millions of dollars are being spent now to give funds to firms who basically go and tell us what I think we already know. <laughs> There's nothing really news about the fact that, hey, you know, um, people don't really want to talk about discrimination. People don't want to hear about that history. We have to pick up the challenge of figuring out how do you tell people about a history? What are the conditions that made it possible for millions of people to actually change their mind about these questions? How many people do we need to change minds about these questions? So there are people who are doing that kind of research. They're just not connected up. You know, you won't necessarily find them in some of the traditional organizations, but you can find them if there's a desire to find some of the new thinking out there um, that if it was brought to scale might make a difference in some of these local battles and then in turn on some of the national battles. Um, so I think a couple of just quick things that we can do. When this case comes down, it's going to change the terrain tremendously, not just for the institutions that are covered, but for all the other institutions that are not, who think, oh, you know, they're actually moving against this, so let's get ahead of the curve. We've got to put our foot in the closing door, right? And we've got to figure out where the doors are closing, how to aggregate our resources so that we can, we can empower people in those institutions and on the ground to have the information they need. Second, I think a lot of our efforts have to be placed in passing the baton on to younger generations. My colleague, Luke Harris, when he teaches um, civil rights history at Vassar, you know, frequently talks about Jim Crow, and the students put their hands up. They said, okay, who's Jim Crow? <laughs> Who is Jim Crow? And we're not passing these stories on to our own young people, much less there was an article yesterday um, about Mississippi um, they're coming up with their 50th uh, anniversary uh, uh, around the integration of Ole Miss. Um, and a lot of the students there have no idea what that history is about. So if we can't share this history, 
and figure out ways of making it compelling to the young generation, there's not going to be anybody to take the baton that we have hand off. So some resources have to be creatively made available for efforts to reach out to young people. Uh, I see one question over there, another one over here, but my question first is when you say this case, for those of us who were so focused on our lunch, can you repeat <laughs> for us what case you're referring to? Okay. Um, so the case is, is Fisher versus Texas. Um, it's a follow-up case to Michigan uh, the Michigan Affirmative Action case. So one of the last decisions that Justice O'Connor made before she left the Supreme Court shocked and awed um, many of the people on both sides of the aisle because she'd never found an affirmative action program that she thought was constitutional until um, this particular case. So she permitted University of Michigan to use race as one of many factors in constituting the law school class at University of Michigan. She had said at the time that in 25 years, we might look back and decide whether we still need to take race into account to maintain the open pathways to leadership so that all Americans can look across the professions and actually see and believe that opportunities were there. 25 years. Uh, by some of our Supreme Court justices clock, 10 years is 25 years. So they're now revisiting the question of whether race can be a factor, however minimal that factor might be, to determine whether or not uh, race uh, can uh, uh, help to determine the qualifications of a particular applicant. 